First, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'm Greg Conti, and I'd like to talk to you about the idea of uh, denial of information attacks. And in one sentence, the idea is attacking humans through the computer system. Not attacking the computer system, but attacking humans through their computer system and how we can counteract that. And here's one example, large shark. Currently, I'm at Georgia Tech, but I'm also in the Army. And I'm here as a free citizen and not as a representative of the government. <laughs> so more specifically, denial of information attacks attack you, the human, and try and get um, consume the limited resources that you have. If you contrast what you can handle versus what your computer can handle in, in certain categories, you'll fall over far faster than, than, your, than your box will. So if it slows you down or alters your decision making, then that's, a, uh, then that's the, a, a denial of information attack occurring. So I think the best example is spam. And I won't ask you, but just consider how many of you have deleted email based on, say, a subject line that you shouldn't have, or you've opened email that you shouldn't have. And I know I, when I talked with my wife about this, we thought it was probably, or you guys are at the leading edge so when email, when spam first uh, started coming out, you probably figured that out pretty quickly. But who's received, and I'll ask for a show of hands, who has received a frantic email from a family member about some virus email that they received or some, you know, if you're local tech support for you or your family or friends, who's received emails like that? Pretty much, you know, almost the whole room. So I think spam is an example. I mean, consider how much time have you wasted on spam and these are just examples. So what I'm trying to do to this problem is look at the bigger picture and look at the structure around it and then how people are defending it and defenses to just add some, um, some structure to the domain. I'll take one step back. And there's some interesting statistics that just recently came out of the University of uh, Indiana, I'm uh, sorry, Indiana University, about, uh, about phishing. And what they did is they went to a uh, social networking uh, networking sites like Orkut and found out who was friends with who. Then they used that information to send out a, a phishing email to college students and they sent them out to 500 people and with, but with the return address of a friend. The emails were just like, hey, check this, this site out. It gave a generic link off campus. That link prompted them for their uh, credentials or user ID and password from college and they were 72% successful, and the students were very mad. But there's some interesting uh, statistics if you take a look at the gender. If a male sent an email to another male, only 53% of them fell for it. You can see where we're going here. If a female sent an email to a male, it went up from 53 to 68%. Female to female, 76%. And then they live in a different world than I do, but male to female, 78% of them fell for it. So that was, on average it was 72, so male to female was the worst category. But I thought the real insight there was using that social networking information. So I don't want you to confuse this with denial of service attacks. Uh, this is a recent innovation from a, a major, uh, a a major operating system manufacturer. Uh, they've evolved from the blue screen of death to the red screen of death. This is from Longhorn. I guess it's Vista these days. Anyway, back to the... It's, it's not cons um, what you consider denial of service where you're consuming system resources, RAM, hard, uh, hard drive space, processing power. It's you're consuming the human's resources is the key difference. And it's compounded by the idea of information growth if you look, I mean, this and information is be gen being generated at a prodigious rate. And I, this study is very, very good. Uh, and I, I'd also like to mention, I personally hate bullet slides, so I have very, very few in here. But on the slides on your disk, on the con CD, I've included an extended version that has more information with links and things. Anyway, I just wanted to highlight one of these. That the, these this is a, a study coming out of Berkeley from 2003 entitled How Much Information? And it's, it's a very good study, except it's like 150 pages, which again is information overload. 
But the surface web at that time, they estimated, was about 170 terabytes, or 17 times the library of, U.S. Library of Congress print collection. So a tremendous amount of information in 19, or I'm sorry, 2003. And that's just the surface web, not the dynamically generated web. So we just talked about, <laughs> we just talked about attacking, like, spam attack, attacking primarily your cognitive decision making. Well, there's other attacks that uh, attack your perception, all right? I had this on a web page. Who, can you, how much work can you get done with that sitting on the web page blinking, right? So that was on a real estate web page. I had to slide it off to the side to be able to get any work done. And I, it just makes me mad. I want to, you know, what were they thinking? Who, who's going to go out and buy coffee based on that? So we talked about cognitive resources and perceptual resources. Then we have motor resources. And the idea then, if you go back to the, the, the denial of information attack, if you're slowing the human down, you're beginning to win. If you're sending them in the wrong direction, you're beginning to win. Motor resource attacks often slow you down. You have to stop what you're doing, grab the mouse, click the pop-up, get back to what you were doing. And I thought this example from hack-proofing your network, uh, again, gave, gives an insight into the idea of the decision-making by the human versus you know, the decision-making by the computer. And I'll read it for those in the back. In the end, all the power of the intrusion detection system is ultimately controlled by a single judgment call on whether or not to take action. So if you can get into that decision-making cycle, you can affect, have, affect major outcomes. I thought it was also relevant to look at information flows. So if you consider signal being what you're looking for if you're out on the web, for example, or in any information space, you're looking for certain information, that would be the signal. Noise would be everything but what you're looking for. So the best case would be signal is very high and noise would be very low, so that's the best situation. So what you're trying to do is increase your signal to noise ratio. If you consider a small amount of signal and a small amount of noise, it's still manageable for a human. So you can look at this list of 10 things. And even if it's 50-50, you can still pick out what you're looking for. Some Google results are, are like that. But it starts getting worse when you have low signal to noise. And particularly, you have a lot, of, a lot of noise, a little bit of signal, what you're looking for. That's the domain of the denial of information attack. And then you start getting into denial of service. If you have lots and lots of information, then you start uh, overcoming your computer's resources. So that's more the denial of service attack. So if you consider this web page, and this is weather.com. I started going to specific news sites, and then I thought I'd get in trouble for whatever one I chose. So I thought weather would be safe. So if you went to this website to get something done, and I actually tried to do this to find out Las Vegas weather. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hot and dry. What was I thinking? But <laughs> anyway, if you, say you came to this site, and putting your signal-to-noise ratio goggles on, and all you wanted was the... the you know, the United States weather and some basic weather information. All of that is noise, okay? So it just tremendous amount, and I know there's some plugins for various browsers that help, but the idea, if you can just get down to the signal, it's a tr it's tremendously better experience. So besides the idea of the signal to noise ratio, and the keynote speaker at Black Hat was uh, Gilman Louie, who also mentioned this up, uh, mentioned this. He is the uh, CEO of Incutel, which I think is a CIA, CIA uh, startup funding, venture capital company, pretty interesting. But anyway, he mentioned the OODA loop. And the OODA loop is, was uh, observe, orient, decide, and act. And it was developed by a Colonel John Boyd, who was in the Air Force. And this came out in the, the, the 60s about how fighter pilots make decisions. And if you could make your decisions faster, then the other person, you could go through this cycle, then you win. So if, consider if you're in a certain situation, you're even looking at a web page or any looking at logs, you have to observe the data, or even your e email is probably the best example. You have to observe your email, and after you've observed, observed it and oriented yourself to it, then you have to decide, what do I do? And if it's a, if it's a, a puzzling subject line, you spend time, you're wasting time, you're slowing down this loop. And then after you do it, you have to act, and typically action requires some 
physical response, which is a motor response, which will slow it down. So if you're slowing the other, your opponent's uh, OODA loop down, again, you're, you're conducting a successful attack. So you can have people go through cycles unnecessarily, or you can slow it down. So with that in mind, observe, orient, decide, and act, let's look at the web page again. And this time, if your task was to just find out, uh, find out your local weather, which isn't available, and it took me a while. So you observe, observe this, and, the, and the orient yourself to it, and find out where, where do you type it in? Where do you get your local weather? So think how, how long it would take. Well, it turns out it's there. Everything else is noise for the task at hand. So you've slowed the person down as they go through that. And granted, they've got business reasons for doing so. They want to show you ads. Some, some of the news websites are the worst offenders of all. Okay, so moving forward, let's look at then, we've seen some of these examples, big examples. Let's look at how people are defending against these type of attacks. And I, and I spent about, oh geez, three years of my life reading Slashdot every day, looking for denial of information attacks in the news, and certain trends came out of it. And clearly there were, there were legal responses, and you can consider the anti-telemarketer legis uh, legislation, for example, and, as well as regulatory. Uh, there were moral responses, public relation campaigns uh, from the Motion Picture Association of America, for example, like you'll put our employees out of their jobs if you pirate, um, pirate movies. And I, I was particularly intrigued by the, the use of violence. Violence is, a, a, if people are receiving information they don't want, violence has been a, a proven countermeasure in certain instances. And I was particularly intrigued by the uh, Let's see, Charles Bauer, Charles Boer case, where he received one spam too many and snapped and started sending death threats back to the spammers. And he was arrested for his troubles. So I want to take a harder look at, all right, you've got these limited resources. How do they all interplay? So this is you. And I've modeled it, and I, it's hard, may or may not be able to see it. But those, uh, those boxes represent your cognitive capability, short-term memory, long-term memory. And that's you, in the, that's you in the red square talking to your computer. So the arrows you see between that, actually, along this boundary, that's your vision, your hearing, your speech, and your motor. So the input-output through your computer, which also has a limited amount of resources, CPU, RAM, uh, hard drive space and I.O. And it communicates, so you're the information consumer. You're consuming information produ from information producers. And you need to pull that information in, say from websites, over some sort of communication channel. Those are servers out there providing you the information. They too have um, limited resources. And often there's a human sitting there, you know, the spammer hits the send button, but they could be things like uh, unattended machines like sensors. So if you take a, a closer look then, you can see where these attacks take place. For example, um, if you use very small text, like in legal agreements and EULAs, um, you will, uh, that's attack against the vision of the recipient. Spoofing the browser, you know, some of the phishing attacks that have taken place occur along that HCI boundary. And I just found this useful to get a feel for where these things are occurring, to look at uh, atta where attacks are taking place, maybe where new attacks could take place, as well as where some defenses could be put up. So if you look at defenses, there's a, the, the HCI boundary between you and your computer, there's been a move forward in the notion of usable security, like security actually people can, can it gives them the information they need. Uh, TCP damping on the communication channel will slow down if, it, if a certain number of email exceed a given threshold, the, they'll slow down the, the network pace. And I believe that's actually, there's some uh, penalties in capture the flag on that front. Or pushing, most of these push the problem back to the attacker. So you see computational puzzle solving. Attack requires, if you want to send this email, for example, requires a small amount of CPU space on the attacker. And I'm particularly intrigued by Paul Graham's idea of uh, the Eliza spam responder. And who's heard of that idea with, for spam and Eliza? Okay, good. The idea is Eliza is a, 
an early uh, straightforward artificial intelligence and program, program that was designed to be like a psychologist. So the idea then is you have a, a listening on a given port or email address. The email comes in. If they can uh, craft it in such a way that the spammer buys the response and people all across the Internet do that, we win. So it's a pretty intriguing idea. And it shows you, again, it's denial of information, how little resources, you know, the, the spammer is re relying on a mag you know, or, um, economies of scale, 10 million email at the press of a button. If you can, you know, 1% of those people eat up a little bit of time, you've won. So I thought this was uh, a Slashdot. I, I love Slashdot. There's, it's like this hive mind, and there's always interesting insights. So from Slashdot on this subject, I have a little PHP script that I use whenever I get a phishing email. The script generates fake credit card numbers and expiration dates and repeatedly hits the sites, um, the phishing sites form dumping in random information. Any halfway intelligent fisher would, res would record the IP address and just dump all of mine when he saw they were bogus. But it makes me feel good that I at least wasted some, some of his time. So again, you know, you push that back. If a lot of people did, and I'm not encouraged, well, I don't want to get drug off in shackles, but it is intriguing the idea of pushing the problem back to the to the spammer. So I've I've looked at this well, honestly, entirely too much this problem. But I have there are several papers on it that are on my website. Then I'll give you the link at the end, and it's on the CD. Uh, but if you're interested, uh, you know, on any of the papers on the website that are like pre-publication. Um, you can send me an email and I'll send you a private copy for review or something like that. And most of the others are available if you're interested in more. I just tried to hit some highlights I thought you'd find entertaining. So given that big problem, I, I wanted to look at the, a specific domain. And I, there are a lot of people working in spam. So I've looked specifically at network security. And in particular, the idea of using information visualization as a way to deal with that problem of inf denial of information attacks. Because there's this battle, and you see it during Capture the Flag, of hiding your activities from the human who's monitoring the system or the, the um, intrusion detection systems or the defenders. So I was looking at information visualization to do that. So I came up with a tool uh, that's a, a, a PVR, uh, and it monitors network traffic will load historical data sets and provides different specially crafted windows to hopefully provide you insight. I, at Innerzone, I had a friend we, uh, who said they thought they might have to change the rules of capture the flag if all of a sudden you could see network activity in useful ways. So and that's the idea. I mean, all the space we're in, everything's one-upmanship. So I thought, OK, you know, we have the, these windows, and that's useful. Well, how, um, how can we attack them? You know, the, the kind of take it one step forward and look at how can we look at the traffic in ways that are useful. Then take it another step and say, okay, knowing this, knowing how we all think, okay, this is in place, this is cool. How can we attack it? So this is what the tool looked like, and this is just a, a quick snapshot, and it's using the Microsoft Virtual Desktop to show a few different panes at the same time. I'll demo this at the end. Okay, so last year at DEF CON, I gave a talk on, on a related subject, and the first question was, how do we attack it? And so the, combined with the interest in my interest and in, in your interest, I thought it would be an interesting space to look at. And you'll find in academia, not many, I mean, if you're not in the security field, generally you're not in the security field. So you can make a lot of progress just by you know, looking at their stuff and breaking it for them. It's pretty fun. So that, that led to the, the work on malicious visualizations. And then the idea was attacking the human through their computer, through their, their system that prevents, presents information to them in some way. So ideally, you can understand how these attacks c occur, then you can design better, better ways to protect yourself. Ah, I was motivated by Pokemon. Now, I know at a normal academic conference, people wouldn't know the answer to this. But why was I motivated with, about Pokemon as far as attacking people through information technology? Seizures. Okay, very good. In, in the late uh, 1990s, there, were, there was a specific Pokemon episode that fl had rapid flashing red lights in 20 to 30 hertz. Okay. 
Well, it turns out that people who are, have photosensitive epilepsy, that's just the right frequency to trigger a seizure. And reports vary, but thousands of people went to the hospital with nausea, and several hundred went to the hospital with, because of seizures. So it, it got me thinking about reaching out. I know that's a very specific case, but I think the prevalence in, in, in the U.S. population is about 2% through the lifetime for epilepsy. So it's, not, it's non-zero. But it got me thinking about through, th attacking people through computers. But then I want it to be realistic. So, you, yeah, I mean, you want, just want theoretic attacks that never occur. I wanted to look at, well, how could, where can you really insert information into pe what people see, and how can that little bit of information impact a lot of information, or the, the display of the information? So I, I made some assumptions. I'm not dosing the system. I'm just adding a little bit of information, trying to skew the results as much as possible and trick people. Uh, as well as, in some cases, I think it's reasonable to assume you could alter the timing of the data, particularly if you had access to the sensor or something or the network uh, somewhere in between. You might be able to slow it down. But I really focused on adding a little bit of information. And, it, and I did not assume that you compromise their computer and you have full access to the database to do whatever you want with it. I wanted some places where you could really do it. So, you know, network traffic is where I spent most of my time, uh, particularly in this area, because, I mean, clearly you can spoof packets, you can inject things. I mean, you're constrained in some ways by protocols or upstream uh, network devices, but still the, the network, you can insert information pretty much at random, as well as some of these, these other domains. Any place where you can insert some amount of information, then, then there can be a problem. So going back to the model, I assume that anywhere in that space along the communication channel or the information producer could insert a little bit of information. And then the timing attack would occur even on the sensor itself, but uh, I was looking more at the, uh, between the network in between. So how do these things manifest themselves? I looked at all the different places where they could manifest themselves, but I've chosen some highlights here I think uh, would, would be best just to, to show you the idea. So I focused on your computer, how people can send a little bit of malicious information to your computer so that it'll present you a lot of uh, malicious information in a, in, a vi in a visual display. So I, th what really got me thinking is just some tools, and this is a $10,000 visualization tool, it labels things, only puts 20 labels on the display. So if you exceed, you know, hit a threshold above 20 labels, labels start disappearing. So I thought, oh, you know, if there's certain, if you can exceed limits of the program, then you're gaining ground, you're slowing people down, they may miss what you're, what you're trying, what you want them to miss or see what you want them to see. And even better in displaying information, oftentimes labeling algorithms are used and you can see here that it doesn't take much to start filling up a display with labels and you know dropped out here and they're not even sorted in this one so perhaps just a little bit you can start hitting the threshold and even better I think is you see auto scaling algorithms where uh, this uh, this graphic the left hand side shows ports on external computers that are talking, and on the right-hand side are ports on your computer. So it connects the dots between one to the other, what port to what port. And on the, if you look at the little detail, that's, those are, you have a great deal, that was the initial display, it was like one to 135. And it, but this tool auto-scaled. So initially, I saw exactly what I wanted to see. I winged one port, one packet to a high port, it auto-scaled it, reduced all that relevant information down to one pixel. So then you have to waste time, grab the mouse, zoom in, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out, just by winging one, pe one packet high. Now you may think this is just arbitrary, but you see this in real life. This is a very common um, web anal log analysis program. So here, and this is from the Netty at Home project, you see a spike of activity. And actually, this was slash, a site being slash dot. So yes, it's more akin to a denial of service attack, but it does illustrate that you can impact, I mean, web logs, you can enter information in. I mean, you probably send ASCII art into web logs if you were so inclined. Um, but that input in the logs, and then you can alter how the information is displayed. 
So you see that on the day of the slash dotting, it flatlined everything else. So, you know, everything else gone. Also, this is the spinning cube of potential doom, which you may have heard about. And the idea is it shows network flows in 3D space. And in the foreground, though, if you look at how information is rounded down, then in, in the, this is a whole class B network mapped so that 2 to the 16th bits uh, mapped along about five or 800 pixels. And the entire internet is on the green line. So you're mapping 2 to the 32nd, more or less, along the, uh, along the vertical axis. So you're losing a great deal of information. And then the z-axis, blue, that they're mapping the target port. And it turns out that an attacker, if you're using this to watch your network, the attacker would be able to operate with tens of thousands of degrees of freedom as far as destination port, so, um, destination IP, and source IP, and illuminate only a single pixel. So again, that looking at the scaling in, in place is very significant. And of course, just using a little bit, uh, it's, you put it with something on the screen, it's easy often to put something on top of it. Some types are more uh, susceptible than others. As well as just inserting some random noise or carefully crafted noise. So how do you protect people, how do you protect your, your users from uh, small amounts of information having a major impact on what they see? Well, the first thing, and there's no cure-all, uh, in, in systems where there's some degree of authentication, um, then that's better than no authentication, or limited where you just basically have to click on an email to verify your identity or something. And this is, I think it's not a, pro like for you, I'm just telling you for entertainment purposes this next one. I'm telling the uh, other people that this line because they need to do it. That, the, that you need to design systems with malicious data in mind. Oftentimes they live in a utopian world and design systems where they just think all, only happy data will arrive. So, but to design systems with malicious data, as well as to train users to be alert for them. And we were, you, you train uh, you know, people not to give away their passwords over the phone or whatever, um, that you train users to be aware of the weaknesses, as well as to allow them to customize the system. So again, there's more on this. This paper is on your CD if you're interested in some more detail. And as well on the CD, I've got some other links you can go to for more information. One moment. So this is a tool I released at Black Hat, and the idea is it's a network PVR, and each of these windows each of these black squares is a thumbnail that shows you your network traffic. So let me go ahead and, and load a packet capture data set. And this uh, data set is a packet capture from HoneyNet Scan of the Month. And you can see it's loading the packets. And there's 3,300 packets. So this is what I was working on. Remember, I'm going back to what I said before. I wanted to build tools that would raise the bar on what type of, how visible tax are to the people watching the networks. Then I wanted to take a further step and look at, well, how could that be subverted? So I'll point you toward my Black Hat slides, and I'll, I'll be posting those in a little while where it goes into more detail on how this works. But I'll give you a quick, a, a quick tour. And this is also on your CD. The idea is there's different views that show you your data. most straightforward, and they all operate in tandem, so what you see in one occurs in the another. So if we play it, you start seeing the data, different views are all operating in lockstep. So the most straightforward one is showing you the text in the packets. This is a text view. It'll go and show you the uh, ASCII, or the, uh, dec uh, the hex view, as well as a, de uh, a decimal view. But anyway, things like it has a, uh, the strings command built in, so you can filter just for the 
the text strings of a given length in the packets. This view shows one packet per line, and you can see it tells you, it, it illuminates the pixel on that line if that hex value exists. So for example, in this, this region here, that's the printable ASCII range. So if I hover over it, you can see that that's a B, a J, and so on. So you can see that w the, the characteristics of it. It'll also do the frequency of the bytes per packet and you can set a threshold. Anything above a certain threshold will be hot, so we can move the threshold down until we start just kind of finding the tipping point. It looks relative to each packet in that case. I, I, don't, pad, I don't pad anything. Yeah, this is, this is very straightforward. It's kind of like an initial step. I mean, there's all sorts of like entropy algorithms I could use to do all sorts of cool things with this type of view. And then you see diagonal lines, which are bytes occurring in each packet, but changing with a cons regular consistency so you can look, look at the slope. So that's one, that's the byte frequency view. I think you'll find this one particularly entertaining. This is called a parallel coordinate plot and essentially you're connecting the dots on these axes. Where, where I'm going with it is it's connecting the dots between um, every header field that's possible. That's my goal. I've got 17 fields in it now. So if I go like this, it shows, it, the, shows the fields. Keep going. The idea then is you can go through one at a time and see each packet and see its values for every header field. Or you can play it. And what you see growing on the right, that's the IP identification field. You can see the distribution of IP addresses. And you know the idea then is you can take 5,000 packets, roll them through this, and at least get watch them unfold and get a feel for what happens. So you can see random activity for a given field. You can see sequential activity. You can see things that don't change, things that change a lot, and so on. I'm going for a whole model of interaction here, like a mixing board that allows you to constrain everything and update the displays as well. So anyway, given this tool, let me show you one or two more windows, and then we'll, I'll show you how to attack it. They're using it for capture the flag, too, to show the network, so on occasion. So you could have some fun. This is more of a matrix view, and I won't go in, it does have some, some uses other than just looking cool, uh, but I, I won't, we're, we're kind of tight for time, and I, won't, I don't want to blather on about it. But what this is, one packet per line, and it's showing you the bits in the packets. So if it's, if it's, the pixel is on if there was a one on the wire, so you can see different types of packets. And it's, you can see at a glance the length of the packet, as well as I've pl played around with such things as, well, show me the printable ASCII values in there. So when I do that, it grays out everything that's not printable ASCII. And this is, uh, the blue is printable ASCII. So you can see at a glance what packets after you filtered things contain printable ASCII. I've also played around with the idea of no ops. Uh, I like the idea of disassembling code on the fly, looking at things as if they are executables, and perhaps you as an analyst, if it's color-coded by common op codes or something, will be able to look at the the flow or the packets and say, that looks like an executable going across the wire and it's not supposed to be there. Perhaps you'll see something your intrusion detection systems or anomaly detection systems won't. And the final one, think of this as battle zone for, for networks. It's connecting the dots between any fields. I don't know if you can quite see it in the back, but it's connecting the dots and then it pixels fly off and slide off the screen based on what, and this is showing uh, source IP to destination port, TCP port, so, but as it happens, it, they fly off the screen. So you can see a variety of activities. And the way it's set up is you can compare anything to anything. So there's all sorts of crazy combinations that might be of use to you. And if you have the different windows open, 
you know, all at the same time running lockstep, you might be able to find things you wouldn't be able to find using today's tools. So anyway, this is on your CD. Uh, I'd encourage you, and I'll give you the link to go to the uh, the website where you can download the latest version. I made a, a little bit of a fix that'll make it it crashes on a certain header condition. So, uh, but it's I'll, po I'll post that when I get back from DEF CON. Anyway, going back to the topic. So that's the tool. Then I thought, how can I attack it? So let's look at some basic attacks. Apparently, uh, uh, it really doesn't take much to bring down a visualization system if you're so inclined. So I, show, I showed you what normal looked like. Uh, something odd happened here. So let's go ahead and see what the attack looked like. Now this is only 203 packets, so if you were displaying information, looking at a data set, watching capture the flag, I'm using random IPs, and we're only at 30, and it's already becoming crowded. And look what's going on on the uh, UDP, this is color coded, so orange is UDP traffic. You can see that it's filling up the display pretty quickly. With only 180 packets, it's already a windshield wiper effect. Well, as it turns out, you don't need to hit every single port. You need to know what it's, you know, make a best guess at how it's scaled. So I only need to like hit every 60th port of, with a packet to draw the line and create that solid effect. So let's look at another example that totally melts it down. So again, just a small amount of information can generate a lot of noise for the human. So this is 1,300 packets. This is pretty much a nuclear meltdown. Now you can change the speed as well, so I'll change the speed to max. And look what's happened on the IP address space. But you can also see what I haven't messed with. So perhaps something is constant in that some way, maybe they have a consistent time to live or, or something that you can grab a hold of and create a filter to counter this. So again, I tried to create the tool and then think about how it would be attacked and then how we can defend and it never ends. But I think this is worth looking at. So that's a meltdown. There are other interesting uses. Who, who saw the talk at Black Hat? OK, if you saw the talk at Black Hat, don't give this away. But there are other interesting uses. So this is 600 packets. And if you look at it, say, in the parallel coordinate plot display, you can get it, you know, the 600 packets, you can look and, and see a quick overview of what happened. Okay. And again, you can run through them. Well, really, it just looks like a lot of uh, source IP or source uh, ports were in use, but other than that, not the same IPs were used. So let's play it again, though, with a different view. So if we look at the frequency of the packets, then, you notice odd clouds of packets, of, byte, of groupings of bytes. Then if we look at it as a rainfall, remember, this is one packet per line. And the way this is, it takes each byte on the Y or maps it to a pixel as a, two, as a grayscale. So you can see the rainfall effect of the bits on the, of the bytes on the wire as grayscale. Um, it's have I or could you? Uh, right now the the the, uh, there's a degree of flexibility built in. The question was, how much can you can I change the mapping of colors? Well, 
Well, the, the extent as it stands, there's no technical reason you couldn't do that. As far as what it's coded, I have filters built in. Right now, they're straightforward. I want to go to greater complexity, but uh, they'll filter certain streams of TCP, UDP, um, ICMP. And you can change the colors by clicking on there, and that'll change it. Uh, but I, the degree of customizability isn't there yet. But it's certain, there's no technical reason that couldn't occur. So just to wrap up, uh, I, again, on your CD, you've got the talk slides. The, uh, the roommate tool itself is on the CD. The uh, malicious visualization paper is on the CD. And there's a hacker convention article I wanted to point, to you, point you toward, because I know some of you have um, difficulty explaining why it's of value to come here. Or is it just me? So I was able to get into the communications of the ACM, which is like the Professional Computer Society's lead, ma lead journal on why computer scientists should attend hacker conventions. So hopefully um, we can change some perceptions out there and you can wave this around in front of your, your husband, wife, or boss, or parent. And that's on the CD as well. I'm looking for anyone who could give me feedback on, on that tool. Um, I, it's at roommate.org, and I, it's, again, it's, the, it's there. It's on your CD as well. Uh, I'm, trying to, I'm in school, and I'm trying to graduate, so I need feedback to make it better. And right now, I've got a two-page, five-minute survey. If anybody would be kind and see Julian, it, I'd be uh, permanently indebted to you if you could fill, take five minutes of your time and fill that out. It would help. And it basically, if you're an ethereal user or a snort user, is just to be some quick questions on how can people mess with your minds if you are using that tool or how they have been. Lots of people to thank. I've been, I've been iterating through this in, pro, uh, in small groups, and I've gotten a lot of feedback from a lot of people, so too many to thank at one time. Finally, I wanted to end with, uh, I've had a good experience at Georgia Tech, a very positive experience. And I've enjoyed the, uh, they've got an undergrad and grad or master's and PhD programs in InfoSec. So if you're interested in that, you can send me an email and I'd be happy to answer your questions or point you to someone who could, as well as they're looking to partner with industry. Again, this is part of my business case for coming out here. Uh, they're looking to partner with industry and government. So if you're looking to kind of like outsourced R&D, uh, they're very much up for that. And the website or I could point you to more information. So with that, are there any questions? Yes. Okay, the, the website is outdated as of now. So I wanted to release it at Black Hat. So when I get back, the version on the CD is like 1.7 something, and I have 1.8 something that I will release as soon as I get back. It'll function. There's, it, it's IP header length. is If it's not five, it'll crash. Okay. Uh, which is five is the normal value, but if you get other other things, then it'll it'll crash. But there's a, so on the CD is a sample file, and a key point is it doesn't load PCAP natively. So I have a little conversion tool that converts it to the file format. So the tool's on the CD, it runs on XP, and I have a sample data file on there for you to take a look at and play with. Okay. Yes. I have not, but I, def I don't see any reason why not. I mean, I want to do. I want to show like the picture of what it looked like or whatever with the the PCAP file and the file format for my tool. Uh, just have them there. I mean, they're they're not sensitive or anything. So yeah, absolutely, I want to share them. And uh, but I haven't. What, it's one of those things. Like the week I get back, I'll be working that. The, okay. Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Julian's in the yellow shirt. If you, uh, if you, any of you could fill out the survey, if you've worked with Ethereal and always wondered how you could mess with people through it or work with Snort, I would appreciate it. And if anybody's interested, I'll be outside.